morning. Uh, welcome to Bible study today. Good to see you all here this morning. Trust you all got some rest after the rally. What a great rally we had. Amen. Good to see what God is doing. Praise God. We are continuing a Bible study series this morning called The Carpenter's Trees. I started this uh, last week. And we're going to continue this for a number of weeks, studying uh, this throughout Scripture. If you look at the New Testament, we find Jesus having, uh, often he has significant interactions with people at trees. And then, uh, of course, we see Jesus, uh, he teaches parables about trees, he teaches lessons about trees, and of course, this shouldn't be surprising, he was a carpenter. That was his trade for the thir first 30 years of his life, was wood, woodworking, trees, etc. So that was his frame of reference and how he related many of the truths of the gospel. And so the revelation is that when you really look at these lessons from the trees, you see that many of them are pointing to the cross, and so this Lesson series, this is not necessarily something fantastically deep. I don't want you to be reading your Bible and every time it says the word tree, you stop and go, oh, right? You know, you, you, get, you can get too weird, but we want to just find what are the lessons uh, from the cross that we can find. So last week we talked about the tree of revelation. This is Nicodemus hiding under the tree, but God saw, Jesus rather, saw where he was hiding. We, we gained some understanding from that. Today we're going to talk about Zacchaeus, and this is the tree of perspective. The tree of perspective. Let's go ahead and get our opening scripture, Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. Then, then Jesus entered and passed through, the, passed through Jericho. Now, behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was, a, uh, he was of short, short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that away. Pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus. Make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, He has gone to, the, to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore four, four, fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Okay, the tree of perspective. We want to talk, first of all, about climbing trees. So our scripture it begins with a very simple premise. It's about a man who wants to see Jesus. He is trying to see Jesus, which is good. But he can't. He is unable to see him. Luke 19, verse 3. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. Okay, so this was pr a practical, physical limitation. This wasn't some deep theological thing. There was a crowd Zacchaeus was short, he couldn't see him. This is every time I go anywhere, right? So, <laughs> it was funny, we were, uh, yesterday, uh, I forget the context, Claire was sharing with me, she was somewhere, and uh, you know, one of these Omas saw her and based on the way she looked, began to speak to her in Afrikaans, and she's like, I have no idea what you're saying, you know? Someone translated, oh, she wants you to grab the honey off the top shelf for her and hand it to her. And I was like, well, no one has ever asked me to do that. I, not, <laughs> no one's ever. So, but this is true for every one of us, isn't it? We all have 
limitations that keep us from seeing Jesus correctly. What are some of these limitations? Give me some ideas. What are limitations, Jonathan? Okay, lack of faith. All right, what else? Yeah, Jacques. What is that? Sin, okay. Lack of confidence, okay, probably. Traditions, yeah, is that what you said? Yeah, old mindsets, things like that, good. Any other ideas? What are things that keep us from seeing Jesus properly? Yes. Rejection, pride. Okay, you guys are thinking deep. Let's, let's, let's make it real simple. What was Zacchaeus' problem, right? Obviously, he was short, but that was a physical limitation, right? Is it possible that we have physical limitations that keep us from seeing Jesus? Yes, of course. So let's talk about these. Let's talk about some of these limitations. And I'm just going to name a couple, right? There are many. You named many good ideas here. The first is the obvious one, the physical. I believe in Jesus, but I can't see him. Can you? Right? I've, I think I've told a story before when we were in Gallup. We had a lady come to church. You know, people come to church that are odd. They're out there. And, and uh, they said, this lady wants to talk to you. I said, yes. You know, can I help you? She said, I just want to let you know Jesus is here. And I was like, yeah, I, I know. I, you know. We're in church. Jesus is always here. And then she's like, no, he's right here. <laughs> I was like, oh. Okay, you sit right here. <laughs> But the, the, we have this physical limitation. I, we can see the effects. We can see what God does. But we are not able to physically see Jesus. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. So listen, this is the reality. By default, you and I are greatest Sensory inputs are physical, whether that's sight, sound, touch. But none of those senses work when we're trying to see Jesus. One day we'll be able to see him clearly, but we cannot do that. So we have physical limitations that keep us from seeing Jesus. We also have wrong ideas that keep us from seeing Jesus. And Kosanati mentioned tradition. This is just one of them, but we can have things in our mind that will block us from seeing Jesus properly. Many people, even good Christians, have wrong ideas about God or about Jesus. And they may be big or they may be small. It might be that you just have a wrong idea in part, but these affect our ability to see Jesus. There are things that many people believe that limit our ability to see Jesus. It could be culture, it could be tradition, it could be religion, it could be our own misinterpretations that are incorrect, right? I pray for the sick very often and you will run into people that they will say, no, no, no. I, I have this condition because God is teaching me something, right? And you know, uh, we could spend all morning d discussing this, right? So I, you know, I often ask, well, what's the lesson? What is he teaching you? And no one can ever answer that. Well, I, I don't you just, right? But the problem is they have an idea that is causing them to see God incorrectly. They see Jesus, the one that willingly died for them, as someone who would intentionally give them cancer. That's wrong. Right? There's, no, there's no way you can pull that out of Scripture. And so these things will actually cloud our vision. Mark 16, verse 11. And when they heard that he was alive and he had, has been seen by her, they did, not, they did not believe. They did not believe, right? They heard that Jesus had risen from the dead, but they just simply could not believe it. I, I preached on Easter from this text, right? The disciples believed more strongly in Jesus' death than they ever did that he was the Messiah because they had wrong ideas. So we see this. Wrong ideas can limit our ability to see Jesus. Of course, sometimes lack of experience can limit 
our ability to see, right? Many times people see God incorrectly or they fail to see him simply because of lack of experience with him. It is easy for me to believe in miracles because I've seen so many. But if you haven't seen miracles, it's, it's practical to say, hey, I don't know. I'm struggling with that, right? That if you've never seen a body get healed, then it almost makes sense that you struggle or you have a hard time seeing that. Luke 1, verse 34. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know? She's saying, how is this possible? I, I can't. She's saying, I've never heard of an instance in which this could possibly happen. And so it is causing her to see incorrectly. So we could go on. There's probably many, many other ways that we see Jesus incorrectly. But here's a few of them. So in our scripture, Zacchaeus climbed a tree in order to force the issue. Luke 19, verses 3 and 4. And he sought out to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of a short stature. So he ran ahead and he climbed up into the uh, sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. Okay, this is very practical. For Zacchaeus, the only issue was he was too short for the crowd. I'm short, I want to see Jesus, so I will climb a tree so that I can see him properly. Now, I want to point out something here before I get too deep into the lesson. This is good. This is not evil. The desire to see Jesus is good. Can we all agree on that? Right? That, that's coming from a good place. This is a good motivation. And I, I don't want you to get the wrong idea based on the lesson that I'm teaching this morning. But we also have to understand that lots of times bad things come from good motivations. We can have the right idea, we can have the right desire, but it may not produce the right thing. Think about this for a moment. Zacchaeus climbed a tree in order to see Jesus. If we were to try to apply that to you and I, how do we climb trees to see Jesus? How is it that we try to force the perspective? Daryl. Okay. Yes. Right, so we climb the tree of knowledge. I want to see Jesus better. I need to learn more. Good. What else? Yes. What's that? Possibly. There was a hand this way. Who was it? Yes? The Bible. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Uh, not, not really what I'm looking for, though. Uh, to, to know more about Jesus? Is that true? Do people do that? And there you go. I should have put that on my list. All right. Okay, so let me, let, let me go into these. Number one, and this is the biggest one, is what Daryl said. We climb the tree of knowledge. Too often, we try to educate ourselves into revelation. Now, you need to understand something. I believe you ought to read the Bible. I believe you ought to study the Bible. My whole life, my whole job is studying the Bible. And you are never ever going to hear me tell you that studying the Bible is wrong. So, so don't, don't misunderstand that. But there is a difference between knowledge and revelation. And the problem is, is that we live in a generation in which we don't know the difference between the two. We believe that knowledge is revelation. Romans 1, verse 22. Profe professing to be wise, they become fools. Professing to be wise, they became fools. I believe this is possibly one of the greatest mistaken ideas in Christianity today is the notion that knowledge is the same as revelation. And I think that's where most of our false doctrine comes from in the Christian world, right? We've got schools, right? We've got Bible schools, we've got teachers, we've got Christian bookstores, we've got Christian magazines, we've got Christian radio, we've got Christian television, Christian internet, 
right? We have all of this data out there. And the problem is, is most people think that that's it. If I just get more data, if I download more knowledge or information, then I've got revelation. But that's not true. That is not how it works. Revelation comes from the word and from the word alone. And it comes by the Holy Spirit working with the word in your personality as you read it and you develop a relationship with Jesus Christ. The problem is that in the Christian world, it has not be, it's become a not about knowing Jesus, but it's become knowing about Jesus, right? You can buy these books, 21 Things You Never Knew About Jesus, right? 47 Rules for Following Jesus, 32 Tips for Having a Relationship with Jesus, and in none of those books is Jesus. It's just data, about Jesus and listen that's good you do need to know about Jesus but this is where you find it the, the, that's the difficulty here is that we live in a world that is governed by information and data and because of that we are not getting revelation Matthew 11 verse 25 and that time Jesus answered and said I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and have revealed them to babes. This was Jesus' uh, statement. And he's, he's basically saying, God, I thank you that you hid real revelation from all of those that think they're too smart, basically. He's speaking about the religious, those that spend their lives studying about they were getting knowledge they had books in schools and he says God I thank you that you hid it from those but you revealed it to the innocent to the babes basically to converts to people that will just get to know me so we climb the tree of knowledge to try to know Jesus sometimes we climb the tree of experience you know this is dangerous is that Many times we put Jesus into the box of our experiences. We redefine God or Jesus based on what we have experienced. I've, I've talked to people, listen, God can help you, whatever. Well, Pastor, I've just never seen that. Yeah, but I mean, who are you in the grand scheme of things? You are a blip on the radar. God, who has always been and always will be, you are now redefining the eternal based on how your life has been for the last six months. That doesn't make sense. Well, I don't know. I asked for a job and I didn't get one. Yeah. You're talking about, right? you get what I'm saying. That doesn't, but that's how we all view Jesus, isn't it? Well, but one time, you know, my auntie told me that. So we change our perspective on the infinite, supernatural, omnipresent God based on our experiences. And then, of course, we can climb the tree of outside opinions. What is frightening to me as a pastor over the years is how often Christians will change their view of Jesus based on what people say to them, and usually people who aren't even Christians. People will come in, they'll give their lives to Jesus, and God will radically change their life. You can see it. And they'll testify, God has changed my life. And then they meet somebody, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's someone at work, and they're just like, well, did you know? Right? Jesus got married. Right? And they'll, they'll give him some, you don't even know this guy. And all of a sudden, your view of Jesus has changed. How? That doesn't even make sense. Right? I've been married. In a couple of months, it's going to be 25 years I've been married. If I ran into someone today, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we go to Nando's for dinner, right? And someone says, hey, did you know that your wife and tells me some crazy story? I'd be like, I've known her for 25 years. I don't even know you. Please leave. Right? You have no... But man, Christians do this all the time. They'll come in. Pastor, you know what? I was at work yesterday, and uh, you know, they told me that actually tithing isn't in the Bible. And they're like... Wait a minute, you've known Jesus for 10 years, and this loser, through one word, you've changed your opinion of Jesus? Galatians 3, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians, 
who have been bewitched, you that you should not obey the truth, before whose gifts Jesus Christ was clearly betrayed among you as crucified. He's saying, who has bewitched you? Someone's messed with your mind. You know Jesus, you know the truth, and yet uh, someone has gotten inside and messed with your brain. So we can allow the opinions of religious people, of sinners, even of the world, to affect how and what we believe about Jesus or how we view Scripture. But here's the problem. When we climb trees to get a different view of Jesus, it's always a false perspective. We're always seeing incorrectly. Luke 19, verses 3 to 5. And he could sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and he climbed up into the sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that, that way. And when Jesus came to And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and he said to him, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Let me give you a very practical tip, and this isn't very deep, but if you're ever in a position where you're looking down on Jesus, you probably have the wrong perspective. Can we all agree on that? Can we, you know, if we are in a place where we are intellectualizing Jesus so much that we're looking down, we got a problem. This is what Jesus says, Zacchaeus, what are you doing? Get down. This, you're never going to see me the right way from up there. This doesn't make any sense because when we try to create our own perspectives of Jesus, we are always wrong. We're always going to come to wrong conclusions. This is why Jesus said, come down, Zacchaeus, this isn't going to work. Your sycamore tree of knowledge, of experience, of opinions, that, that's not how you're going to see me correctly. The tree of knowledge, right, when you're climbing that tree, it's going to seduce you into believing that you can understand or figure out Jesus. If you ever get to a point where like, I figured it out. You're wrong. Trust me. The, the Bible is God's revelation to us, but it's not everything. There are, Paul talks about the great mystery, and it will always be a mystery. If you get to a place where you believe there's no more mystery, you have gotten to the wrong uh, conclusion. The tree of experience puts Jesus in this box, God, and when Jesus is in the box, you say or think things like God will always or he will never. He must always do this. He must never do that. And again, that is incorrect. The tree of outside, outside opinions, of course, taints Jesus with the lenses of man's ideas. Quick question. Since when does God need our opinion or our approval? Right? You know, you, you, when we talk about... God and the scripture, a lot of times people say, but I just think, stop. Nobody cares what you think. What does the Bible say? Well, I just think that, stop, 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 stop. I didn't say, what do you think? What does the Bible say? Well, I think that God really would, again, stop. It's not, if you've read the Bible, and here at the Potter's House, we encourage that, you will come to the conclusion that what we think is irrelevant it's what God says that matters and we either choose to believe it or not what we think about it is irrelevant right imagine right now how you feel you know your your emotional state how happy or unhappy are you right here imagine there's somebody in in China in a village somewhere and this morning they woke up and they thought you know what and they just they thought of you and they thought you know what? he's really dumb does that change how you feel at all? You've never met them. You don't know them. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant, right? What you think about what God says has about the same impact. It just doesn't matter. So these are the trees of perspective. I want to stop right there and open up for questions or comments before we move on. Tree of perspective. Perspective. 
Any questions, any comment, lift your hand. If not, we'll move on. Going once, twice, sold. Okay, we're going to move on. Let's talk about coming out of your tree. Coming out of your tree. Jesus challenged Zacchaeus to come down out of his tree. Luke 19, 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. In other words, okay, Zacchaeus, good effort. I appreciate that you wanted to see me, but you got it all wrong. If you want to do this right, come down. Let's talk. I said in the very beginning of this series that these trees, they are lessons from the cross. Last week, the lesson from the cross was that Jesus sees you right where you're hiding. The lesson this week is that here is the challenge of conversion. Will you willingly allow your view of Jesus to be changed by who Jesus really is? Because we all have a view of Jesus. We all have a perspective. That's what the tree is all about. He climbed up to get a new perspective. Conversion really hinges on this question, will you allow that picture of Jesus to be changed? Maybe your picture of Jesus was what you learned in Sunday school. Jesus was all beautiful hair and carrying little lambs, right? Are you going to allow that to be changed to the Jesus that made his own whip? How do you learn how to make a whip other than having some experience? Are you going to let your view of Jesus be changed by the truth of who he is? So that's the challenge of perspective. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, I can see you want to know me. So why don't you come down and let's talk and you can really know me. So this is about changing your perspective. Whatever your perspective is, it must be changed to align with Scripture. There's a few perspectives in our scripture or on our text this morning that need to be changed. There's the perspective of wealth. Zacchaeus was a very wealthy man, right? He was used to getting his own way. In that culture, this man could do whatever he wanted. That, that was the nature of it. He could buy whatever he wanted. He could go whatever he, wherever he wanted. That's probably why he climbed the tree. He was upset that he couldn't see Jesus. Because everybody else in his life listened to him. Hey, Zacchaeus wants to see you. Like, yes, yes. You wanted to see me? Because he was wealthy. And now Jesus wasn't listening. So he climbed the tree. He's trying to force the issue. So you're going to have to allow that to be changed. Luke 19, verse 2. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was a chief among the publicans, and he was rich. Money can make you view the world in a certain way, like you can control it. But you know, it's interesting, in the Bible, when we use the word wealth, it actually is a two-sided coin, right? We always think of people that have money, but the reality is, is money always affects the way you view the world, whether you have it or you don't. If you have a lot of money, a lot of times you feel like you can control the world. That was no doubt Zacchaeus' problem. He's climbing trees with his wealth. I am going to make the world function how I want it to. But on the other side, when you lack money, you feel like the world owes you something, don't you? Well, but I didn't, and you better. Right? No doubt in this same crowd, there, were, there would have been people on the outside saying, who is this Jesus? They said he's the Messiah, but here I am, poor and hungry. He's not even talking to me. I guarantee you there was someone in that crowd saying that. Because that's in every human crowd. Why isn't he? Why wouldn't they come? And so here's the reality, is that our uh, finances, in whatever state they are, they affect our view of God. And they affect our ability to see Jesus. So here's one of the lessons of Zacchaeus' tree, is you're going to have to change how your finances affect your view of Jesus. Jesus told Zacchaeus, get out of that tree. You can't see me from up there. If you think you can control me, you don't understand me. If you think I owe you, you don't understand me. And so whatever tree it is, Jesus says, you better get out. 
You're going to have to change your perspective. Or another way of saying this is you can only come to Jesus on his terms. That's the way it works. You cannot force it by your wealth and you don't earn it by your poverty. Then, of course, there is the perspective of self-will. You know, Zacchaeus was in the sycamore tree, but he was also in the tree of his own choosing, wasn't he? In other words, he dictated the perspective. He said, this is the angle from which I choose to view Jesus. But we all do that, right? We all choose our view of Jesus, right? It's funny in churches um, how attached we get to our seats. Do you notice that? And I know when I say that, people are like, no, pastor, no, no. Yeah, whatever, man. If you walked in this morning and someone was in your seat, it'd be like this. You walk into church, hallelujah. And then you got to get saved again. Okay, they're, they're a visitor, all right. But we're like that in a lot more than just chairs. I need to have an altar call right now. I can feel it. We're in the Gallup Church. The, the, the sanctuary, the stage was round, and so the chairs were like round. And they were set up in a certain way, and then we, we cleaned the chairs. I don't know what it was. They had taken all the chairs out. And so when they set them all up, the guy said, hey, can we set them up in a different way, you know? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't care. I mean, as long as they're all pointing at the stage, whatever. And so they did. Well, what I didn't realize is the chairs had been set up that way, I think, for like 20 years. They had been in the exact same spot. And so Sunday morning... The church walks in. I'm talking 200 people walking that building, and they're like, like they're on a on a ship, you know, like they're, what? Where's my seat? It's not that someone's in it. It's gone. It doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> it's, a, it's a crisis. But you know, we're like that. We have our own way. This morning, I guarantee every person in this building, you have a view of Jesus that you chose. I, you choose to view Jesus as such and such, right? You've got an idea of what he looks like, right? No doubt you heard the story. There's a little girl coloring, and her mom said, sweetie, what are you coloring? She says, I'm coloring Jesus. So, well, sweetie, nobody knows what Jesus looks like. And she said, they will when I'm done. <laughs> but you've got this in your mind, how Jesus deals with things, how he answers prayers, how... And that's fine, but you have to realize you created that, and it might not be true. And so when you read the Bible, when you hear preaching, you must always be willing to let your perspective of Jesus be altered. It should be edited, right? There's times, I, and you know, I've been serving God. I got saved in March of 1996. I've been serving God for a little while. But, and I, I believe I've, I've got a, a good view of Jesus, but still, I'll read the Bible sometimes and think, whoa, wait a minute. And there has to be a little edit made. You know what? Your view of Jesus, we're going to make a correction here. Because that's what it is. So we have to change the perspective of our self-will. Jesus challenges us continually. You can't see me like that. You have to see me like this. There's the perspective of religion. Luke 19, verse 7. But when they saw it, they complained, saying, He has gone to be guest with a man who is a sinner. Sure, we have a rebellious screen, so uh, anyway. But in our scripture, Zacchaeus goes to Jesus, uh, and now Jesus goes to Zacchaeus' house, and it says, They complained, Who is they? It was the religious people. That's who the crowd was. This was the religious elite. They are complaining about this whole uh, interaction. But listen, it wasn't them that Jesus was coming to see. He didn't say, hey, listen, all you religious hypocrites, come eat with me. He said to Zacchaeus, the, the, the public sinner, Zacchaeus, I want to eat with you. Listen, it doesn't matter how high you climb in religion, religion will never help you see Jesus. You hear me, if you've come to this church for any length of time, almost every service when I do the altar call, I will say something like, and religion won't cure your sin, or religion isn't an answer for your sin, because it's not. 
Only the blood of Jesus is. Religion, going to church, even reading your Bible and praying, those are all good things, but those are not what get you to heaven. So Zacchaeus' tree asks us this question. Can you separate yourself from the religious mindsets that dominate your perspective and learn how to really see Jesus as he really is? So this is what it means to come down out of your tree. All right, I want to stop there for a moment, see if we have any questions or comments before we move on. Do you have any questions or comments on our lesson so far? Lift your hand so I can see it. Yes, and Kosanati. They're going to bring you a mic. Hold on one sec. So I just wanted to find out um, what does this mean with regards to the commentary? Because. Um, with regards to. Commentaries. Commentaries, okay. Yes. So does it mean that we discard them or. No. Because they comment on the Bible. No, no, not at all. So that, that is a tool of Bible study, right? And as I said in the beginning, I believe in Bible study. We must, but we cannot ever let that become a replacement for our relationship with God. Because I've met people that know the Bible better than me and have never been converted, right? I've, I've witnessed people that are stone-cold sinners, and yet they've, uh, there's one man, I probably told you the story before, but he memorized the book of Romans, right? And I'm like, that's like a weird flex, right? What? <laughs> So, and he's like, uh, Paul with Aristotle. I'm like, well, well, hold on. I don't need you to quote it to me. I don't need to prove it, right? So the, the, we, we value all tools of Bible study, right? But the point is that knowledge is never a replacement for revelation. Yeah, very good. Daryl. Are you guys going to bring a mic? Run. Full speed ahead. So, so you see in the Christian world, these uh, pastors, they call themselves doctors because they've got doctorates. So they do, right. They're not pastors, so, so they doctor the, mm. because of the knowledge. Yeah, and that really is a, is a pride issue, right? I know a couple of men with uh, THDs, right? So they technically have doctorates, right? But I won't let them call themselves doctor, right? <laughs> so, so, please, save it. <clears throat> and, unless you uh, want to look at my tonsils, you don't call yourself doctor. Pastor Lieb. I say it's all about revelation, but what about yes. some people that their revelation is a bit screwed up, they are messed up in their head when it comes to revelation? Because I've met some people that know the Bible, but then they've got the revelation, it's like you got the wrong thing, that is not what this right. is all about. Yeah, but see, I don't think it's possible to get wrong revelation, right? If it's wrong, it wasn't revelation, right? People have all kinds of ideas, right? Joseph Smith saw visions, so I don't... I, uh, the issue, revelation, will always line up with Scripture. It's never going to be new. It's never going to be separate. It can be validated and verified scripturally. So, am I answering your question? Okay. Very good. All right, so let's talk finally about the power of a changed perspective. Hopefully, if I can get this quick enough, we'll have time for a few more questions after. The power of a changed perspective. Our Scripture shows us that Jesus invited Zacchaeus to eat with him. Luke 19, verses 5 and 6. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him, and he said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Here is a picture of fellowship. He says, I am going to eat with you. This is a picture of being in right relationship with Jesus. So, Here's a very powerful idea for you. When Zacchaeus' perspective changed, then he was able to have relationship with Jesus. There was no relationship with wrong perspective. There was no relationship until he had proper revelation of Jesus Christ. So here's the encouragement for you and I. If you will allow Jesus to change your perspective that is what fuels healthy, living, vibrant relationship with him. I can tell you of a few moments in my life when God had to change my perspective about a few things and I saw something shift in my relationship with God. One of them was 
a, a very practical thing. I remember in prayer, I'd been praying about a specific issue. There was a person, there was a, it was a conflict, it was some drama, whatever. And I'm praying, God, you got to change their heart and, you know, move on them. And, uh, you know, I always pray. I sit in the back row over here and I had a good prayer meeting. I felt like, all right. And so I get up and I leave and I'm driving home. And right as I'm coming up, that uh, the Morocco bypass there, man, it was so clear. It's like God opened my eyes and it was like, no, I don't need to change their heart. You're wrong. Don't you hate it when God does that? Isn't it better if God like fixes them? But it was like, I'm driving, and I'm like, oh, yeah. I, really, I, I am the whole problem in this situation. It's my heart. It's my mind. It's the way I see things. God, it was like a paradigm shift. It's like God turned the whole thing around. I could see the world differently in that situation. So if you will allow God to shift your perspective, man, it will change your relationship with Jesus. Obviously, the most practical is you must, or the most important is you must allow him to change your perspective of him. Jesus says to Zacchaeus, stop looking down on me. Come down here where we can talk face to face. Let's heal this perspective so our relationship can operate properly. Then, of course, you must let him change your perspectives about the world, about people, about surrender, about morality, about your past. Matthew 5, verse 21 and 22. You have, you have heard that it, it was said to those of old, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in, in danger of the judgment. Interesting. In Matthew chapter 5, five times Jesus says, you have heard it said, but I say to you. In this one, you've heard it say, you shall not murder, but I say to you that hatred is the same. You have heard it say that you shall not fornicate, but I say to you that lust is the same. Jesus is saying you need to change your perspective. But this is what fuels our relationship with Jesus. You cannot be in right relationship with Jesus unless you're willing to let him change your perspective of him. But then when our perspective of Jesus changes, we can change. Our scripture has this powerful word, the word then. It says, when Zacchaeus came out of the tree, perspective changed, and it says then. Luke 19, verses 8 and 9. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the, to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything, if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Um, and Jesus said to him, "Today salvation has come to to this house, because he has, he also is a son of Abraham." A, a very important point that you need to see here: Zacchaeus was not changed when he climbed the tree. He wasn't changed when he desired to see Jesus. He wasn't changed when he showed up at the meeting. He was changed when his perspective changed. In fact, what's fascinating about the story is that nothing else happens there. It doesn't say Zacchaeus came down out of the tree and then Jesus laid hands on him. He didn't zap him. He didn't give him a Bible study lesson. But when he came down, when he changed perspective, he got a new heart. This man that was a thief, that was a criminal, he was robbing his fellow Jews. In the act of changing perspective, something radically shifted. And he says, I am giving back, I'll restore fourfold if I have taken anything. Listen, this is a radical transformation. And Jesus validates it. He says, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. Listen, this is the picture of conversion, right? How many of you, when you got saved, your view on life changed, right? That's what it means to be converted. 
The word repent actually means after madness. I, w- I was crazy and now I'm not. Literally, my mind changed. So when you let Jesus change your perspective, that's what conversion is. And this is important, especially if you've been saved for a while. Because you get these old entrenched perspectives of Jesus. And sometimes sermons challenge that, don't they? Right? Sometimes we get sermons and they poke us. Like, hey, hey, hey. Leave me alone. No, no, I'm comfortable. But it's when we let God change our perspective that conversion is still happening. Listen, it should not happen just one time when you bowed your knee. It should always be happening. Every time you hear a sermon. Every time you read the Bible. Any time you're praying and talking to God, God should be changing your perspective of him, slowly editing and altering these things. When we come down out of the tree of pride or arrogance or domination, then we will be changed. And you cannot help but be changed when you get a proper view of Jesus. Hebrews 12 verse 2. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The author and the finisher. That means the beginning and the end. The one that started it and he will finish it. And then what we see from our scriptures, ultimately we can become a blessing to other people when our perspective changes. Luke 19, verse 8. Then Zacchaeus. Then Zacchaeus' student said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I have given half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. So here's a, a, the radical shift. One verse before this, he's the thief. He is the criminal, the robber, whatever you want to call him. Uh, he's the tax collector. He's all the evil things that a Jew could think of. And he changes perspective. And now he's saying, I'll give half of everything away. I'm, I'm going to freely be a blessing. Can I tell you, those who are the greatest blessing to the world around them are those who have learned how to see properly. Those that have learned how to see themselves correctly. That was lesson number one, wasn't it? Learning how to see yourself. Those that learn how to see Jesus correctly. That's this lesson. So here's this incredible lesson Jesus gives us In the story of Zacchaeus, he sees you climbing whatever tree it is, working so hard, trying to get a vantage point or a view of Jesus. And yet in his compassion, he's showing you a better way. If you just come down, come see me face to face. He says, I want to eat with you. I want to build a relationship with you and I can change you. Amen. I want to stop there. Let's open for questions or comments this morning. If you've got a question or a comment, lift your hand so I can see it. Talking about the tree of perspective this morning. Okay, Lloyd, you're in the front. He's coming. Hi, Pastor. So, yeah, yes. um, just a comment. Um, or, yeah, just I remembered, um, uh, like, uh, with the uh, passing of my wife, um, I remember after the and started coming to church mm. and I just remembered um, a specific day a family member it's like they asked me like um, uh, you know like we were all praying and um, you also praying but why like why did God allow that mm. and so all of it, and, and as they mentioned that there was like something always like to do with my flesh it's like yeah uh, you see uh, 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 why did God allow mm. that? But then just immediately because I, I knew, I know who God is. Like I have a revelation of who God is. Yes. And, 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 and my response to her was that, um, uh, uh, yeah, no, God, uh, uh, God, sometimes we serve God and we just expect all the time good, good, good. But mm. we, obviously because we live in a, a broken world and all the things that happen. Yes. And, 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 and sometimes we, we, we pray for things, but it goes in a, in a different way. And, it's like, but uh, the bottom is like, bottom line is that because I n- know who God is, God like loves me, God never changed, God is not confused. Yes. And uh, even though I don't understand or whatever, but I leave it with God and, um, and in spite, uh, yeah. Yes. Because of God and, 
and, and I think the thing that helped me a lot was it's because I, I, I had a revelation of who God is. Mm. That in spite of whatever, God is still a good God. Yes. Us, and, and he wants to still help us. Yes, absolutely. And that's why having a revelation of who God is is so vital. Very good. What else? Questions, comments this morning? Okay, Nathaniel? Yes, Pastor. You mentioned you'll, you only come to Jesus on his terms. So I want to know, is it only once you change, you allow him to change your perspective of him, or is there more to it? Is there only, did you say? Yeah, only once you change your perspective on him. Well, like the lesson is, this is a continual thing, right? So I don't think there ever will come a point when our perspective stops changing. So, but yes, in the beginning, that's the first thing. We have to one day realize Jesus is Lord, and I'm not. That's usually the first step of conversion, but it's constantly happening. So I'm sure you've, you've seen it over the, the year or so you've been saved, where, you know, a month later, then you, you learn something new or you see something differently. That never stops. As long as you serve God, God is helping. He's fine-tuning your perspective or your view of him. Yeah, very good. Question is it. Very good. What else? Other questions, comments this morning? Who's they're pointing this way? Okay, Daniel. Good morning, church. Morning, Pastor. Uh, when do you know that you are ready to to to, be, to 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 be saved? Because each time you just speak of the you step uh, and all the call comes up, you you, you step to, to 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 begin. Right. So you going to fail. You're not sure. Where, right. Well, you know, I think a lot of that, that's the devil that messes with us, right? Because we need to get saved as soon as possible. It shouldn't be when we wait until it feels better. The devil is always going to bring that, the fear, you're not going to make it, you'll do something dumb again, right, or whatever. So uh, that's the devil that messes with you. I, I say you need to, you know, if anyone is wrestling with that, uh, you need to respond immediately, right? And then let God help you, because God will. Yeah, very good. Good question. All right, church, we're going to break. Uh, we're going to begin our morning service here in about five minutes.